So um, the first thing to ask is, what does the posterior mean? And um, it's a summary, basically, or just a probabilistic description of what you know about the model or what you believe about the model. And uh, it's maybe worth noting, although I don't want to spend much time on it, that within uh, the community of people that consider themselves Bayesian statisticians, there's actually two significant camps of uh, uh, people who uh, describe uh, themselves as objective or subjective Bayesians. Uh, and what that, uh, I don't think those are particularly good uh, terms for, uh, you know, for the difference between the two. But basically, it's a discussion uh, about whether you should use uh, an informative prior or uh, the maximally informative prior you can come up with or some kind of least or weakly informative prior. And uh, another way of describing it is whether you uh, objected, I should say, which is which, the uh, subjective uh, Bayesians are the school of Bayesian statisticians who believe that the best thing to do is to use uh, all the information uh, that you have and to use the, uh, an informative prior, the best informative prior you can come up with. And sometimes that's described as letting the posterior describe your beliefs about the model instead of our beliefs about the model, instead of the communities. The objective Bayesians are those that favor using some type of uh, prior which you can derive in some unique rigorous, well-defined way, or at least restrict this uh, case as much as possible. And as it turns out, those are all um, uh, relatively uninformative priors. <laughs> the objective Bayesian feels that you shouldn't take advantage of all the information you have. You should rather give up as much arbitrariness in the prior as you can. And uh, uh, a particularly extreme, or well, the terms sort of came into existence with Jeffrey's work on uh, Jeffrey's prior. So Jeffrey's prior uh, is a prior which is essentially uniquely well defined for any given data set. So so-called objective uh, Bayesians believe that since everyone could do that, you know, it would be independent of who you were, uh, you can come up with a uh, prior. And the fact that it may not reflect all the information you have is a sacrifice you make to have a, a well-specified choice. And uh, there's a surprisingly large number, well, maybe not, but a, a large number of papers that have been written uh, in the statistics community sort of debating back and forth uh, those two issues. I think for working scientists, you're best off being somewhat agnostic and uh, doing both, actually, as I discussed last time. But uh, you will occasionally um, hear uh, people describe posteriors as subjective or objective. And just again, as, uh, as a matter of nomenclature, mostly subjective posterior implies an informative prior and objective implies some kind of lip or lip type prior. And it could be any of those that we, have, that we discussed last time, like maximum entropy or whatever. Um, so, um, in a, in a simple-minded or mathematical information theory sense, uh, the posterior contains all of the information that you get out of the analysis. The posterior is your result and uh, sort of end of story. But uh, for practical working scientists or, or practical applications of basic statistics uh, by anyone, uh, posteriors often uh, have a lot of problems. Uh, as a result, for one thing, uh, they can be very hard to um, uh, express or understand. There's some sort of function, often a multi-dimensional function, uh, generally a multi-dimensional function. Uh, 
Uh, they're kind of hard to use. They're kind of hard to get published. They're hard to remember. Uh, it's hard to describe them in your abstract, you know, this where you have some, some complex function. So there's a lot of uh, emphasis in uh, practice, practical Bayesian statistics in summarizing your posterior in some way or the other, uh, and reducing the, uh, and that almost always involves, I, I think it would be fair to say always involves, uh, throwing away some of the information that you might have had in the posterior in order to get something that's a little more conceptually easy to handle or express or remember, or whatever. Um, so let me make, uh, start another list. I'm very fond of lists. Um, the, uh, which is a symptom of autism, by the way. Uh, the, uh, but I won't make a list of the symptoms of autism. <laughs> but, uh, the, um, the first one uh, is to simply tell everyone, or to say, uh, what is the maximum likelihood prior. So that's just the maximum value of P of data. I'm sorry, given the model, given the data. So if the model is just a parameter, data, a single parameter, you know, then, then whatever it is, it's just the maximum value there. Um, a, a very confusing uh, piece of nomenclature is, uh, you know, that's worthy of astronomers of having invented is Bayesians often call that the maximum likelihood estimator, which is not what it is. The maximum likelihood estimator is the maximum of this term of likelihood, uh, and is the thing that uh, classical statistics often takes, uh, you know, the sort of fundamental mistake of naive classical statistics is to think that these two things are the same, in a sense, is to think that the maximum the model, you know, the model that's most likely to produce the data is also the uh, model that's most likely to be true given the data. And it's as, you know, it's as to complete a logical error as saying A implies B uh, corresponds to B implies A. It's that same logical error. But nevertheless, they, if, if you see uh, someone throwing, saying MLE after they have done a, um, a Bayesian analysis, Almost certainly, they they are not talking about the maximum of this function, but the maximum of that function. Um, so that's just something to watch for. Uh, if the uh, what did you say the official term was maximum likelihood. What's the official term for this? Say again. What is the official? What's the correct name? You say maximum. It's the maximum likelihood posterior. You can say you can also say the maximum likelihood model or maximum likelihood model parameter. But I think the clearest one is to say maximum likelihood posterior because and likelihood isn't even the ideal term. Yeah, exactly. Why would you call like maximum posterior? Right. Yeah. yeah that's what <laughs> maximum of the posterior is. I don't recall seeing that very right. often, but, but anyway, it's, uh, that's, that's more uh, correct. Um, now, you know, if you have a nice, well-behaved, reasonably symmetric kind of posterior uh, with a clean max, single maximum in it, uh, Theta one, uh, the data. You know, even if there's multiple peaks and things, especially if they're not too close, that's that's a pretty useful thing to think about. In multiple dimensions, though, it gets much more complicated because the maximum uh, probability of some vector of of, of parameters theta may not be in the position of the maximum of any of the individual values. So the most likelihood, you know, the, the set of values you write down, if I, I tell you where the max is, let's say you have some three parameter fit or something. It's simple, 
and uh, you tell me where the maximum of the uh, distribution is, the posterior is in these three dimensions, uh, it can perfectly well be in a place that none of them are. They're independent. And they may not be independent, they may be dependent. So it can put you off in some, as a summary, it can put you in some odd part of uh, parameter space. This is this would be the case you're looking puzzled. Please ask a question. But let's say where the probability of theta 1 is high, the probability of theta 2 and theta 3 are very low. And the probability where if theta 2 is high, the probability of theta 1 and theta 3 are very low, and so on. So No, but is this for the joint? The, you the want joint to look for the maximum of the joint, not the joint. individual right. parameters, right? That right. can be different. I mean, it is still the maximum likelihood overall. Uh, posterior, but it may not be a particularly favorable value of any one of those. Uh, Can in, you show a two-dimensional example? Yeah. Sorry. In, 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 in uh, pathological cases. Um, in other words, if I just evaluated, if I fixed one of them. Oh, that can be different. Yeah, so you can get confused or, or be in a place which, you know, doesn't look like a particularly good fit in terms of that one variable. Mm -hmm. I didn't say that very clearly. Um, so, you know, there's, you're throwing away quite a bit of information there. Uh, another thing that's, that's very popular uh, is to talk about a confidence interval. Uh, uh, posteriors are great for uh, writing down uh, confidence intervals. And, um, However, there are ambiguities in using confidence intervals, whether no matter what kind of statistics you're doing, because which confidence interval are you talking about? If I have a, you know, some kind of simple Gaussian distribution, uh, we're all, all used to thinking of the confidence, and let's say the 95% confidence interval is this thing here, where you know, 0.025 of the area is over here, and 0.025 is over here. Fair enough, and that seems like the only thing a sensible person can do. Now, of course, it's not unique. I could take the 95% and just slide all the way over here and just leave 5% over here. Mm -hmm. I could leave 5% out in the middle at the most likely place, or I could, you know, put 17% there and 80, you know, 18% here and 50 whatever percent somewhere else. I can come up with any uh, distribution of, uh, of positions that add up to 95%. But wouldn't you try to put it where uh, the length of the interval is minimized or something like this? Yeah, there are various ways, I mean, which is what I'm coming to, uh, right. defining you know, what, what's a good confidence interval. Would you make uh, a difference depending on what answer question you're trying to answer? For instance, if I want the confidence interval on a number of larger events, right. Than a certain limit, then I only care about the lower bound. Right. Mm -hmm. As opposed to being within the, the measure of that dependency. Mm -hmm. Right. If I want if I want to say my most likely value is so and so within uh, you know what's the 95% interval confidence interval where I believe the real thing is, I might want to center it on that. So there's there's a set of confidence intervals that are defined. One is the central. 95% or whatever, the central confidence interval, uh, which is typically centered up on the uh, uh, most probable value. And let's say it's, uh, well, let's call it 90% because it's easier, and we say 45% on either side of that. Now, of course, that's not always possible. It isn't always 45%. maximum can be like here off on one mm -hmm. side. So maybe I only have 20% you know, of the total area on this side to, to work with. Uh, there's also called the, the median mm -hmm. centered confidence interval, mm -hmm. uh, which is to say I go to the 50 percentile point mm -hmm. of this distribution. And then take 40% or 47.5% or whatever on 
each side of that, but my definition is going to be possible. Uh, there is the um, Oh, someone already said it. The minimum uh, uh, size confidence interval. So I just uh, pick the place on this curve that uh, I can get capture ninety five percent of the area area in the smallest uh, um, range of the parameter, which I think is a nice one. And, uh, Sort of automatically, if the function is anything at all reasonable looking, uh, you know, will include the most probable value. It doesn't actually have to, but I can, I can have a function that you know, is like this, and then over here in some low probability area, right. have yes. some spike like that that doesn't right. have much area under. So, you know, in the class of all possible functions, the minimum size confidence interval doesn't necessarily include the most probable value. But, um, Good. And then uh, uh, there's the right, you can um, use it for limits. Uh, so there's a uh, usually you want upper or lower bounds. So, so you can use a balance. Um, so all of those are possible ways of summarizing it. When you start thinking about them in multiple dimensions, they get a little more complicated. Though. Yeah, sure. So it's, uh, if I have a one-dimensional function like that, all of these uh, definitions are, uh, you know, give me a unique uh, a confidence interval on that parameter. Uh, they're less easy to use uh, and uh, have more problematic value, uh, properties and are not necessarily unique if I'm talking about a, um, a multi-dimensional uh, mm -hmm. uh, parameter space. Especially if the um, uh, units of the different parameters are different. Mm. Often I'm fitting something uh, that has a model that's a measure of velocity, and another a parameter that's mass, and another parameter that's whatever, some, some other uh, uh, factor. And so in that uh, parameter space, it's met, you know, just defining the area under the curve in some way that's fair is. Uh, um, somewhat arbitrary. In other words, if I double the size of the velocity parameter and uh, I double it in mass, well, that's not necessarily, uh, you know, it's, you know, that's like using the law to consider those equivalent, but that's not necessarily what I want to do. Uh, sometimes it's measured, and often people want to measure the accuracy in terms of the errors of the measurements of uh, uh, that go into it and the uncertainty, the various ways of scaling the different uh, uh, dimensions of that, uh, in, a, in, a, in the metric in which you are drawing the posterior uh, that will allow you to solve those somewhat arbitrary problems. But there's more than one way of doing that. Uh, so I'm still confused. So why is the area different? I mean, the units of the area will still be, so kilo, uh, so, sorry, mass, kilo, kilograms, or m sum times megaparsecs or kilometers per second, right? So you can still compare the areas between any different curves, right? In this two-dimensional space. So you can still say what is the minimum area? Well, What's the curve bounding the minimum area, right? Well, you can, I don't see how you can exactly define it because if I change units uh, on one end of the radius or the metric, say I go from log to linear or something. The density per unit, whatever will change. Mm. You see. Okay. So there's, uh, so you want to get it into some, the usual trick is to get it into some dimensionless units, like using uh, the log of m over n mops of sun or something. You know, so no, but there also it's it's a problem because whether you use log or ln or yeah, then it changes where the maximum is too. Right. Okay. So there's there's metric dependent issues here. You know. In fact, changing that metric changes the whole probability posterior density right. function. It's not the maximum may not be in the same place that the contours and so on. 
be different because you're taking probability density d log, I mean d something, d log of something, d the square root of something. You, know, right. you can choose things. But um, so there's some problem with those. Um, it's perfectly predictable though, right? From, mm -hmm. It's perfectly predictable to go how how to go from one to the other. Right? Yes, you can understand how to do it. You're just uh, again a sort of advantage of this type of technique is it forces you to be very explicit about that kind of thing mm -hmm. to tell your reader and tell yourself that is more important than how exactly what to do. Other some resistance. Uh, Ways to summarize uh, include uh, expectation values. So, uh, suppose I'm particularly interested in some value uh, of theta one. If you <coughs> call it the uh, theta one expectation value. Of course, is just the integral of the model space. Values in the one dimensional case again is very simple. I can count the expectation value, calculate the expectation value of moments or anything I want. Uh, so, so that's sometimes a handy way of summarizing things. Um, and uh, there are, of course, uh, marginalization techniques. So, if I just want to, so let's say that I have some. Some parameter C that depends on A and B, uh, and I just want to know uh, what the probability of C is given some function A. So I can just do you know, the standard marginalization, the probability of C given A. Uh, okay. A and B, which is like the posterior, uh, that's the probability of B. B, and I, I say that I marginalized out B in that case. So I sort of uh, you know, let's say I have you know I've collapsed it, I put it into the margin, basically. I always think of like an Excel spreadsheet you're adding across with weights into into the margins of the Excel spread, spreadsheet. So it's a way of getting out the information on one uh, um, one of the variables. Like, let's say you want to know the chance of a sandstorm uh, that depends on whether or not it's rained in the last week and what, what the wind speed is. Uh, but you want to summarize that by saying, well, what's the probability of the sandstorm uh, depending on the wind speed? And uh, so you know this, you know, what's the probability of rain in the last week is, you can take it out and just get the probability. Yeah. Now, this is one of those things that, um, as I mentioned, you're always throwing away information when you summarize your posterior. Uh, and this is a good way to th throw away information and fool yourself. Like, um, suppose it never have, you never have a sandstorm if it's raining in the last week. Then after you marginalize, uh, you don't have that information anymore. You think it's just a, a, a function of the, of the wind speed. Uh, and you have lost the fact that, you know, if it's rained in the last week, you don't have to worry about it. Uh, so, Marginalization is very popular. Uh, uh, 
studying uh, real physics problems and stuff, which we'll get to uh, some of them a bit more. But, um, and, and people sort of seem to treat it sometimes as though uh, it's a completely um, benign procedure. There's nothing to worry about. But like every interval, it dumps information. Uh, you don't know what information you've dumped uh, until you know, you're not looking at what you're integrating. So um, it's something to be a little bit uh, careful about. Uh, maybe the final technique, which isn't worth saying too much about, uh, analytic, analytic fits. And more particularly, the parameter value. So um, uh, we've already seen some examples of that. Uh, that's one of the goals of conjugate choices of conjugate uh, uh, priors is to the extent you get out a, um, a uh, uh, an analytic fit and you know its parameters, uh, then you know that's a nice summary. You know the uncertainties of the parameters and so on. You can also get out analysis all you want to back at some of these things. The problem with this is that it's uh, usually uh, only a rough fit, or very often only a rough fit in, in real problems. You mean the in A and the B? Hmm? Or parameters of what? Say that. Why you say parameters, parameters of A or parameters of B or something like that? This, well, this is two separate topics. This is just a correct. This has to do with uh, like quoting a Gaussian mean and sigma. Right? It's this is marginalization. Marginalization is fine. But just one more, more part of what generally speaking. When you say parameter, it only is a parameter. Here, well, like if you had a Gaussian fit, the mean and the mean sigma, and sigma would be the parameters. Or if I fit a power law to the posterior, it would just be the no, this has nothing to do with this. This is the parameters of whatever analytic form you fit to the posterior. Yeah, but priors also contain parameters. They can. So or they can just be tables of numbers too. Because posterior is not the not the very often. Yes, there's no, no there's no guarantee there will be a good analytic fit to the posterior. But if you get a posterior, that I mean, what people very often do is they have a they get a posterior out of their numerical thing that looks you know some something that's high in the middle and low on the edges, and so they fit a Gaussian to it and call the parameters of that Gaussian is what. Is the summary of the posteriors that they publish or think about or plug into further calculations rather than you know this, which is uh, a tabulated function basically. We can't name the tabulate. And then, uh, yeah, well, well, actually, my, my, my really worry is U and the sigma are also a function of A, capital A, or chapter B. When you change chapter A or chapter B, then U and sigma changes. B, I'm also lost. Well, the new is to describe the probability of the data. Well, it's a simple idea that new and sigma are independent of A and B. New and sigma are characterizing the posterior distribution. The posterior distribution, of distribution depends on prior A and B. But prior, it's not prior. These are not prior. A is, and B are prior. No. No. As A and B are priors and only it's not priors. This, this, is, no. this, is, this is all it's just working on the posterior. Yeah. Prior is already gone. It's already gone. So priors are not, not the exact equation. Yeah. I saw the A and B, A and the chapter A and B are priors, you know? No, these are just these are just if I have if I have two variables and I want something that's a function of both of them, I know how it's a function of both of them, but I want to simplify it to tell me how it's a function of one of them. This is, this is just a way of 
I mean, this is just a basic, what is it called, the theorem of probability. Probability, right. Yeah. So what does, what does C? So C, C is some P. arbitrary thing yeah. I want to know. Yeah, so, so what did P, C, A, B, C slash A, B? That means the distribution of the probability of, of C, C given some A. Given some A, so A is variable. No, no mm -hmm. it's just some variable. A is also variable. Yeah, it can be a variable. Again, maybe it's it's. Uh, I said if it was given A, we use optimize E C. This is all of this is a way of taking the posterior after you calculate it. Yes. And summarizing it in some way. It's taking the information that's in that multi-dimensional posterior and expressing it in some more reduced form. So this is just one way of reducing it, marginalization. Another way of reducing it, to calculate an expectation value. Another way of reducing it, uh, of summarizing it, is to fit an analytic form and give its parameters. These are ways of um, reducing it too. They're all just Confidence. they're all just simple ways of describing the function. Yeah, I mean that is just an equation for marginalization, right? Yeah, it's not about right. That's different. Yeah. So, I, I, I don't want some mean, meaning of the strike. This means, yeah. this means C given A. Given A. So I, I, can, can, I, can, I could write yeah, this. You could just remove it. Yeah. C given A. So A is, is, is A, are you? No. A it's just a radio. It's one of the dimensions of the posture. I think that's a fair way to say. So it's the same as the above equation in the top of the, of the blackboard. Here? Yeah, that, that's right. No, this is, I mean, it has the same form. It's the same basic rule of probability, but the meanings of the symbols are different. Well, so the meaning of science are different. What's the meaning of the, of the given, but the, the meaning of I thought they are, I guess, I was, I was none, none of the, for example, none of these are data. And neither are any of them primes. They're just, uh, I'm just transforming a probability distribution. Well, I'm just marginalizing a probability distribution, uh, taking the information of its dependence on one of its variables. So this is a probability distribution or a function. Never mind probability, it's just a function of two variables. Well, yeah. If, if I tell you to, 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 to the meaning of the two, two phase of that file, then I will start. Okay. Maybe we should talk about this later because I'm, I'm not sure. The same. So, the same. So, so. Um, let me. Thirty-five minutes. Um, okay. So let me let me talk about the Bayes factor because I, I think I have something to be a little more. Used a little more, maybe a little less familiar to somebody with all of this. There's also the Bayes evidence. It's also called the Bayes evidence sometimes. Um, the Bayes factor is often advertised as a uh, as a part of Bayesian decision making theory. It's supposed mm -hmm. to allow you to choose between Morris. hypotheses, uh, and. Uh, it's a way of, uh, of uh, in a sense, getting around the posterior, or in a way, a sense of, of uh, uh, summarizing it. So the Bayes um, uh, factor is defined as the probability of the data given one model divided by the probability of getting the data given some different model, too. So this is supposed to be the ratio of the chance uh, that one model gave you the data to the chance that the other model gave you the data. So... Uh, likelihood ratio. Hmm? Likelihood ratio, right? Yeah, that's all called, called the likelihood ratio. Um, and in the Bayesian uh, sense, you get that by 
uh, integrating uh, over the parameters of the model, the probability of the parameters of the model, um, of, a, of a parameter in model one, times the probability that the data will result from that particular problem. Uh, uh, oh, these are all vectors. This, right, I'm changing my notation here a little, so let me write in the vectors there. So by theta one, I don't mean one of the parameters. I mean the parameters of model one. E theta one over the integral of theta two given model two over the probability of the data. Uh, Given model one, the probability of data given model one. And this vector So what is the first bracket? I don't understand. So what is the first bracket? Here? Yeah. This is the distribution of this is like the prior, in a sense. This is the distribution of parameters you expect in this model. So I give you model one. And you so it's a P of theta one. Right, okay. given that you're talking about model one. OK, OK. So oops, yeah. this could be the probability of, uh, I mean, these could be the same parameters or not. Mm. So it's basically the ratio of the denominators of that equation, right? Yes. Okay. Exactly. Um, I don't understand why writing it the second line side. first you write in the ratio of the No, so so this um, so naively, you would think that it's just the first term in the numerator on the right-hand side. But that's not it. It's the denominator on the right-hand side. I think so. Those integrals are expansions of the denominator. Right. Those integrals are, are expansions. Not expansions that are expressions. For expressions for the denominator. So the denominator P of D there is just integral P of D given M, P M, D M. Right? And that's exactly what he's trying to do, except um, instead of m, he is now written theta one, and because the, you could have two different models, right. so that's why he has m one and m two. That's all. Nothing else. No, it's the ratio of the denominators in that equation. For in in the yeah in the context of two different models. Theta one, theta yeah. the, the theta, the subscripts on the thetas go with the models. Right. <laughs> Whereas before, I so it's it's just solving this equation for that. Right. For P. So, so you have P P there. Mm -hmm. Why why you didn't write P? You dropped all the Oh, I left it out. This one. It should be P. Yeah, P. Sorry. Very good. Yeah. So this nomenclature is a little bit complicated here, but uh, yeah, yeah. The, not the notation is very funny. <laughs> uh, I, 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 maybe I'll try to write it in better notation, notation but right. let me do that next time and solve it better. But it's, uh, you're exactly right. It's the, right. it's the chance you get the data, this thing that we're always trying to avoid calculating and just saying normalized by it. The people right. who invented it. P1D, right. It's in the context of model model one, right? So P M one of B and then P M two of B, something like this. Yeah, you want to write it like this. Yeah, maybe <laughs> that one. <laughs> right. Right. You can do this. So then that's different from the likelihood ratio because earlier people also used to talk about talk about likelihood ratios, yeah. right? Part of the idea is trying to get away from the priors. Right. Yeah. 
Uh, this, uh, this is, um, there's a lot of talk about the Bayes factor, and I will claim in a moment a major misunderstanding uh, that uh, goes along with it. But let's say a couple of things about it. First of all, um, if instead of the intervals over those, I just take the ratio of the maximum, suppose I find the maximum mm -hmm. uh, of those, that actually corresponds to what's called the likelihood ratio test in mm -hmm. classical right. statistics. Right. So this is simply integrating over all the variables. And um, uh, the one reason this is nice, there are various reasons, but one reason this is nice is it automatically penalizes Troy Hub, I should say, when the larger Bayes is, the larger B is, as B goes up, our preference for model one uh, over model two uh, goes up. So the stronger, the bigger B is, the, the more we like model one. And uh, just from the way that's defined. Uh, and one good thing about this is that it uh, introduces in a very natural way what you might call Occam's razor, of penalizing uh, a model which is too complicated and has too many free parameters in it uh, that aren't justified by the data, but give an ever better fit to the data. So if you have a model that you know has a hundred parameters and only fitting 10 data points or something, uh, you'll of course find that it reproduces the data very well. But by the time you integrate over all of this, uh, you, have, you have appropriately penalized it or you have penalized it in a, in a, in a defensible way uh, for using all of those extra parameters. Because they, you know, let's say model two is the one that's overfit. If I have a lot of if I'm integrating this stuff over a lot of parameters that don't really produce much better fits to the data, then I'm just adding a lot of area under, you know, to this integral and a lot of value to this integral, and it dilutes uh, the value of it uh, having predicted the, uh, this time, predicted the, the data better. So, um, so, is, is the way you can keep this, you just integrate over the entire range of the parameter that you get, right? Well, you're just using the parameter data, that you just want the probability of, of obtaining the observed data set, the actual observed value given a certain model, and you want to integrate it over the model space. Right, yes, and you integrate over to fire, and then you integrate over the fire range for your data. Right, I don't. Okay. Yeah, that's the but, prior, but there is a prior there, because the, the, the prior of each model parameter will be there. What do you mean there's no that's, prior? That's, that's there, right? That's, that's this that's portion. This right, yeah. I should, I should uh, see if I can work you out an example of this. It's yeah, I think examples will help. But in my experience, it, it is also something which depends quite a lot on how you define your priors. So you can make your prior volume small or large, and then it becomes. Yeah, I, uh, I have some problems with it. Oh, OK, good. <laughs> it, it does have several problems. Okay. The worst of which is people don't understand what it means, I think, or misunderstand what it means. But in any case, this. Uh, without understanding that term in the denominator of Bayes' equation uh, is usually the one we avoid. And in this approach, it's the one you concentrate on. So that's why it's unfamiliar. And, and, not, and it's hard, and one reason we like to ignore it usually is it's often hard to compute uh, and a little arbitrary, and uh, that all of those problems come across into this. But it, it does give the, uh, it does have this nice Occam's razor. You know, penalization. Uh, you have to be sure you're fair. Um, it does not, uh, it also, uh, a thing that's like not so important, I guess, for uh, in astrophysics, but is important in many applications, is you can easily stick cost factors into these, uh, uh, or 
penalty factors into the, the numerator and denominator inside the integral, namely uh, if we're making bets or trying to decide on a public policy issue or you're trying to make a decision that say has very what's called an asymmetric consequence function, so being you know right in one direction, uh, or being wrong in one direction carries a severe penalty and being wrong in other direction carries a minor uh, penalty, that kind of thing. You can stick those into this and get a, a Bayes factor that includes the, uh, the so-called penalty function or consequence function or cost function uh, and uh, look at that uh, um, as a uh, way of making a decision. Uh, it's often uh, said to be uh, a measure of the odds, how you should bet. So if this comes out to be 100, you should take 100 to 1 odds or, uh, you know, it's fair, that kind of thing. Um, and it, this, by the way, is due to our friend Harold Jeffries, who I learned from Masataka was not just a statistician and mathematician, but also uh, a geoscientist. So, uh, for instance, if we're trying to predict the probability of earthquakes, there's asymmetric penalty functions. Um, I don't know that that's what he was doing, but maybe it should have been. Um, and he suggested, and these are this is widely quoted, uh, sort of interpretations of data. Oh, another thing I was going to say about the advantage of this is that classical uh, uh, hypothesis testing only tests against the null hypothesis. In, in classical statistics, you write a null hypothesis on uh, the test, the hypothesis testing techniques allow you to reject it or not. This could be thought of as a model selection mm -hmm. technique, and it's more like how you uh, use it in astrophysics. So you have, you know, two models of uh, temperature profile of the gas and a cluster of galaxies, and one, so you, not re you may not be able to reject either one, but you might have good enough data to prefer one. One more, yeah. Um, so uh, these are these are Jeffrey's, and it's just putting words, but uh, and I think it's uh, wrong and misleading. But anyway, it's so widely used. If beta is less than one, that's of course negative evidence for model one. One model you're comparing, and then. Uh, limits between one to three are said to be wonderful British, hardly worth mentioning. Um, three to ten is said to be uh, substantial. Ten to thirty is said to be uh, strong. Uh, thirty to one hundred is said to be very strong. I think this may be slightly modified. Definitely the real thing. And greater than hundred are said to be decisive. So, so, so um, if B is less than one, then it's negative for model one. Right. So, so why wouldn't we say from B of point two to one? Yeah. It's yeah. hardly worth mentioning from model two. For model two. Yeah, model yeah, yeah, it's invertible and the labels are arbitrary. Okay. But they just usually okay. you know, they relate so, to model. So you, you choose your model one such that you it's the higher probability. But I actually have seen tables of this in textbooks that do exactly what you're saying. The inverts and uh, people list the logs of these and various things, but you get the idea. And um, I, I think that, that nomenclature does hint at what uh, the Bayes factor is actually good for, which is telling you the strength of the data you have uh, against the models you're testing. 
if it's high, then you have data that strongly addresses the distinction you're trying to make. And if it's low, your data is sort of neutral and, uh, you know, uh, my advice, I would make a simpler, <laughs> publish. <laughs> Do not publish. Get more data. Uh, but, um, but the mistake that's, uh, I think, really worth emphasizing and is pervasive in uh, much of the scientific literature on the use of this is that's not how strongly you should prefer the model. When you say it's decisive, that doesn't mean you have decisive evidence that model one is true. It means the data, it's a measure of the change in the support for the model. Not in that, not of the absolute probability of the model. Mm -hmm. So it's how much more likely the model is after the data than it was before the data. But it doesn't tell you, it's not actually that much in favor. And a, a very simple way to, to see that is remember the example, I hope most of you were here on the first lecture when we talked about if I'm a patient and you give me a test. If the, if the test is 99% of the, if I get a positive result, this ratio, uh, you know, and let's say the test is, is uh, positive 99% of the time, if I have the disease, then this ratio is going to be 99. It's increased the odds that I have the disease by a factor of 99. But if the odds against me having the disease to start with were 10 to the minus 4 or 10 to the minus 6, guessing that I have the disease is still a bad, you know, is not the right decision. It's not the way to bet. And it's not the most likely solution. The prior can completely overwhelm this Bayes ratio. Not the priors on the parameter but the prior on the model, which is what we've gotten rid of. Should that go in it? The, hmm. it's, a it's a measure of the change in the odds that I have. The, uh, and that's all Bayes' theorem does, is it tells you how to update your prior belief. Mm -hmm. So if your prior belief that I have the disease is 10 to the minus 4, because only the 10 to the minus 4 of the population has the disease. And you get a test that is 100 times more likely to have come out um, positive if I have the disease than if I don't. Then you go calculate the Bayes factor. You know, model 1 is that I'm sick. Model 2 is that I'm well. So the probability of getting data positive is, is essentially 100. Then the odds against me having the disease are still 100 to 1. They were 10,000 to 1. Now they're 100 to 1. So it's not the way to bet. And it doesn't mean that the model is right. You still have, you can't escape the prior if you want to know the probability that the model is true. It's just the problem. Uh, and a simple way of seeing that is suppose the data is not very decisive. Suppose, you know, 50% of the time you get a positive when I'm sick, and 50% of the time you get a negative. It's indecisive data. And this factor will be about one, but you'll still, you know, so it'll tell you that the data isn't telling you anything useful, but it hasn't changed the odds that I have to the disease. So, so you can't get away from the prior on the model. Okay. You use 500, you still rule out the model? Right. You're, it, the, the chance that the model, it, you just have to, you can't escape the prior on the model. Let me give you another example. Suppose we went took the flying here on the 747 versus on the back of a fire breathing dragon. You're not inclined to believe that I flew over on the back of a fire breathing dragon. Suppose, however, yeah. so we walk outside and there's a fire breathing dragon sitting there. Well, that certainly increases the odds that I flew over on the fire breathing dragon, but. You might still doubt it because you know it's a long way to hold on to the back, and you know there's a lot more people. There's certainly a lot more planes than there are fire-breathing dragons, and who knows if fire-breathing dragons can really fly that far over the ocean? But planes certainly can. So you might still doubt the, my story, but the odds would have certainly increased, and the, the data of having a fire-breathing dragon would 
you know, strongly support that model, but not enough to overcome perhaps your, your prior. This is often regarded by people who hate priors as a way of dodging priors, but it's not. This, by the way, is not a, what I'm saying is not controversial in the statistics community. It just bothers working scientists. And it, you know, but the reason you don't like it is that it says that the data, you've just got a very improbable data. And that's true, too, if you get a positive result. You know, if, I, if only 10 to the minus 4 of the population has the disease, I walk into your uh, physician's office, you give me the test, and I come out positive. To believe that I don't have the disease is to believe that something unlikely happened. It's just that that unlikely thing is more, more likely to be because I can be more likely to be because you've got an, an unlikely false positive. It's no different than all these other examples, really. It's just the population that's out there. There is a subtle bias that comes in the classic example. working in the practice about this, and they always get this, every single one I've talked to, which isn't that many, but more than 10, I think maybe close to 20, they always get the statistics question wrong. But if you ask them then what they actually do, they say, well, I look for symptoms, I look to see if they've been exposed to it, maybe I order a different test, or you know, I'm worried that the false positive is due to some error in the lab, they mixed up the sample, so I run the test again right. They, if you ask them the abstract quantitative question, they, you know, they say that the posterior is equal to the likelihood, but that's not how they actually think about it. They actually, uh, and it may well be that in trying to decide between uh, models and you know working astrophysics, that you have other evidence than just the data. You may, uh, you know, you may know that the isothermal model makes more physical sense or is predicted by in-body simulations or some other evidence that you have. In principle, you can put all that into a, into a Bayesian prior calculation. But Should we be worried about the possibility that we might miss one of these other things? And, um, well, that's not included in our calculation. We might uncover some of the statistical disparities in reality. Yeah, if you, if, if you screw up in setting, if you mess up in setting your prior, you can mess up. It's, it just multiplies into, and you can, and priors can hide things from you. That's why it's a good idea to discuss last time to use both an informative prior and an uninformative prior, because in the informative prior, you know, there's this saying in science it's not what we don't know that causes us problems, it's what we know that's wrong that causes us problems. And there's a very, very great danger of putting something you think you know, you know, that you know, but which is actually incorrect into a prior, and then it will hide it. It will obediently, I mean, there's no magic here, it's just multiplication. It will obediently, you know, hide the truth from you, hide your error from you. So, uh, uh, you know, this is an argument, going back to the beginning of the talk today, that objectivists use, that you should use some minimally informative prior, so that you don't, um, let things you know that are wrong creep into your analysis. But you know, the equation doesn't assume that there's errors in the prior, right? It just takes, it just takes the prior. Uh, where are we? I'm sorry, I, 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 I have not exactly followed this discussion on interpretations. Do you assume two 
22 models here. Yes, you can have your so, you could apply it to a set of models one at a time. So there are many models. I mean, this this integrates over the different parameters of the model. So in this case, I'm not calling a different model on just a different value of the parameters. But uh, but yeah, in principle, you could you could compare a whole series of models this way and say that uh, which ones the data favored more. It, I think it's sometimes better to call this the Bayesian, uh, the other term that's used. Right down. The Bayesian support for the model, or model one over model two. It measures how much the data supports one model over the other. So, you know, the positive results on the medical test supports the hypothesis. That I have the disease. It doesn't uh, demonstrate it, but you know, it's sufficient. Yeah, probably M37 would give B100. B37. The B, B model has many models. So if you don't choose one model, B37, no model 37, then B is more than 100. Then this model is maybe likely. <laughs> right. The more models you compare, the stronger you want to. So that is infinity. And there's some arbitrariness in how you assemble this. You can write down classes of models, you know, and put the differences into parameters and various things like that. Um, well, I've, I've sort of finished the time here, right. and uh, there are some other things I was going to say, but I'll, I'll try to fit them, some of them into next time. Uh, but uh, I, uh, I well, anyway. I'll try to summarize that, but uh, in a certain sense, well, I will actually. This, the summary, I think, is that when you've finished using Bayes' equation and you have the posterior, you're kind of only halfway there. Or you're, you're not, at least you're not all the way there. So, so you better, you know, if it's any non-trivial problem, I mean, if it's just a one-dimensional function, you're pretty much there. But in most real cases where we're using Bayes' theorem, you there comes some part where you have to figure out how to summarize your posterior in the most useful way to, as Steve said, answer the questions you're asking or, you know, make it uh, meaningful to yourself and other people and so on by, by one of these summaries. And there's no single way of doing it and no single way of, uh, you know, it's, it's best. You just have to uh, uh, sort of look at the posterior do various things with it and, and see what seems to be a, uh, an adequate summary. And uh, the Bayes factor is it's a very nice way of measuring the power of your data, and uh, but not a way of choosing between models, which unfortunately is how it's come to, to be known in, in, uh, very often uh, in applications. Thanks. Thank so next time we're back on Tuesday at noon. Yeah, Tuesday at noon. Okay. Thanks. Thank you. So can I have a last one? Just go back to your favorite problem of the brightness of stars.